we talk about emancipation as this great kind of step forward, this great moment uh, in American history. Uh, there are still uh, many African Americans who recognize Juneteenth, uh, which is June 19th, uh, when uh, people who were enslaved in Texas found out in 1865, two years later, that they had actually been emancipated. Uh, and so, you know, emancipation, great. Except that it poses this huge economic problem to the South. When we look at American society, in that period between 1800 and 1860, uh, if we were to measure the entirety of American exports, everything that the United States made and shipped abroad, two thirds of it would be one product, and that product was cotton. And it was not a kind of thing, we kind of have this regionalism that we think of uh, the, the uh, profit making of slavery to be a product of and solely kind of exclusive to the South, but it's really not. Because they are producing all this cotton, which is then being used to produce textiles. And that cotton is being shipped to, out of the South, to another part of the country that is developing its economy around textile mills and factories. And that's New England. And so we find New England connected to the profitability of cotton. And the financing of these cotton enterprises is connected to a whole other system of banking and lending. And these are centers that are in Atlanta, New York, and Philadelphia. And New York continues to go on to become the finance center of the country. And so we can kind of go, we can kind of walk through all of this. And so emancipation and the disruption of the cotton economy produces a real economic question, a crisis. And W.E.B. Du Bois, the historian, uh, points out, the great historian, points out that in one county he travels to in Georgia, he finds that more than three quarters of the wealth in this county was in human beings that if you added up everything that the county had, all the assets, all the valuables, all the collateral, three quarters of that was human beings, and that was wiped out with a stroke of a pen with the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. And so a human being, an African American, who might have cost, cost, been valued at $1,200, which is not an insubstantial amount of money now, has no value attached to them after emancipation. It's a kind of paradox. And so they strike upon a novel idea, which is that you can produce the same crops with the same labor force, but rather than using people who were enslaved, you can use people who were incarcerated. And this is the beginning of the southern prison system. There are places where there are one-to-one -one connections. Uh, Parchman Farm is one uh, in Mississippi. Parchman Farm began as a prison, um, excuse me, began as a slave plantation. After the end of the Civil War, it resumed product production as a prison. Uh, Angola Prison, which is still op in operation in Louisiana, uh, began as a slave plantation and after the Civil War resumed its production as a prison. There were individuals who had been in Angola twice, once as a slave and once as a convict. And the southern legislatures moved in step with this and said that they were going to create a Byzantine legal code uh, so difficult to adhere to that you would break the law almost without uh, ever being able to find. It was more difficult to be law-abiding than it was to be a lawbreaker. And this is like the point of this. The person is arrested, they're sent to prison, the county then leases this person out uh, for a fee. A person who was a farm owner pays the fee to the county. Judges, uh, particularly in Mississippi, would sometimes receive one fee when you're hearing a case. If you convict someone, you get $10. And if you exonerate and acquit that person, you get $7. So there's a financial incentive to create, maintain, and build this labor force. And so we see this dynamic early on and the profitability attached to it. 